In this slide, we want to cover sort of really additional things that you're going to learn, but I've reframed it in the form of questions, big questions that we need to have answers for. First of all, how do we, you, define a customer niche and pursue it? How many customer niches are you currently selling? I find that it's not surprising that a typical distributor has been product volume centric and the idea is to have more salespeople covering more territory. Uh, they could be selling anywhere from a low of 10 to as many as 30 different niches, theoretical niches, when the truth of the matter is all their money comes from maybe two and uh, the rest are, are need some overhauling. Um, how many niches, this is a good question, how many niches can you sell with best form, fit, and service to become the dominant number one in the profit pool share? Um, and let me back up and just say that the best way I can get this concept across is why do decathletes lose to event specialists? And if a decathlete goes out, tries to compete against a world-class high jumper, the high jumper has this tiny, scrawny little upper body and these huge frog legs, whereas the, the decathlete's got a huge upper body for you know doing the discus and the shot and the javelin, and that just doesn't go over the bar very well. So they have a bad structural form. Also, the way they train, they've cross-trained at 10 different events as opposed to tuning their body for just one event. So it, it, we find out that going after different niches often can be mutually exclusive. We can't scale our business up to take care of, you know, a big volume uh, freight sensitive kind of segment and then take care of lots of little, you know, picks in the same warehouse. Um, and then we want to be a dominant number one in a profit pool. And basically, simplistically, that's all the profit potential that could be made of all the customers in that niche. But we can actually expand that pool through profit development, through through converting lose-lose um, uh, customers to win-win. Um, and we want to be a dominant number one because that's we've got economies of scale within that 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 niche scope. Um, or ideally, you know, if we can't be number one, we would say, all right, we can be a number two. And the number one is unfocused. They're trying to be too many things with too many people. They're fading, you know, because companies go through life cycles and they get old, collectively speaking, as far as employees and tired. And, you know, management starts to harvest the business, perhaps. Um, and and because if we can't be number one, a dominant number one, or a strong number two to a, to an unfocused fading number uh, number one, we're we're not going to make enough money. And so that's what we want to do first: is is oppor identify these opportunities. And what are the economies specifically of scale within an niche scope that are possible that we're pursuing or going after? When we understand those, then you'll understand why it's important to be number one sooner or later. Um, the next question is every branch that's you know making any kind of money or it's got a critical mass of volume is breaking even hiding inside that mass of activity there is one historic best most net profitable niche we have to figure what that is so we can get down to it and clean it up and do it a lot better and if we can and we can renew it and, and fine-tune our service value equation and fine-tune our fill rates and, and focus on the 555, then that's how we're going to double the sales and quadruple the profits in that niche. And that's our first order of business. Now, after that, we may pick a second niche out of the 10 or 20 that we're selling and too many of them at that. We'll find out that each niche's service value equation, that's another term uh, that I kind of coined, uh, we're going to figure that out, and it will vary. In fact, that's that's how I decide what's different, whether a niche is different or not, is if there's an important service quirk. And that service is not an extra service. It's an expected. It's a service that everybody in that niche, you know, uh, would like to have. Um, certainly, we want to switch from going from having excellent generic service to uh, specific tuned service excellence for a niche, which gets this last look and an extra point or two, and that just still bugs the, you know, the, the very aggressive customer, even though they sort of concede that, fine, 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 you know, your value is the best at a higher price, but I still don't like paying the higher price. Well, fine then. Let's get married, because we have all the volume. We can start to figure out how to, you know, create a, a relationship, a buy-sell process that will lower our cost to serve to the point where we can actually lower the price for you, and we both do a lot better. Um, and then, of course, we want to focus on the top 10 net present value, net profit accounts that 
historically have been underserved and overpriced by everyone, including us. In other words, they're huge. And we just sort of say, well, glad they're there and glad we have the business or glad we're locked out of the business. And we don't realize they're so inherently profitable that if we're on the outside looking in, we can afford to go in there with more aggressive prices. Not that we'd compete that way first, but certainly far more aggressive service value propositions uh, and exploit the fact that the competition is really doing this with their core franchise accounts. And we're going to exploit that. So there's some of the big questions we're going to answer starting with the next slide. Thank you.